Hello, and welcome back to Animation Movies Revisited, where we take a look back at some of the greatest animated films and rediscover why they've left a lasting impression throughout the years. For this episode, we'll embark on a grand Arthurian adventure filled with valuable life lessons, prestidigitation, and one of the greatest wizard duels in cinema. Prepare to witness history in the making and watch your back for wolves because we're reaching deep into the Disney vault for a look back at the Sword in the Stone. Standing proudly alongside other Disney animated features, including Alice in Wonderland, Sleeping Beauty, and Fantasia, The Sword in the Stone is the studio's 18th animated feature film. Produced by Walt Disney and distributed by Buena Vista Distribution, The Sword in the Stone offers audiences a cautionary tale about destiny, kingship, and the importance of education and exploration of the unknown. Directed by Wolfgang Reitherman, The Sword in the Stone is inspired by the novel of the same name by T.H. White, which is the first part of the author's Once and Future King tetralogy. In Reitherman and Disney's version of The Sword in the Stone, a scrawny 12-year-old boy named Arthur, nicknamed the Wart, meets Merlin, a powerful time-traveling wizard who says greatness awaits the young man and time is of the essence to prepare for what's to come. Wart is eager to learn, but is beholden to his duties as a page and squire for his older and dim-witted foster brother, Sir Kay. Willing to pull double duty as Merlin's student and Sir Kay's skinny blonde doormat, Arthur engages in various activities designed around
until the 1961 release of 101 Dalmatians, also helmed by Wolfgang Reitherman. Before 101 Dalmatians pounced on the box office and barked a total of 102 million, Walt Disney lost his passion for animation. The past two decades had taken their toll on Walt's spirit and the studio's wallet. The situation became so dire that Walt strongly considered closing Disney's animation department. Thankfully, 101 Dalmatians had audiences wagging their tails and offering treats to the box office in the form of dollars. Sadly, even though 101 Dalmatians was a hit, Walt was barely involved in the making of the film. He'd lost his spark, and if Disney's animation department was going to capitalize on its success, they needed a leader. Enter Bill Peet, a Disney veteran and the mastermind behind critical elements of the Sword in the Stone. Pete went digging in the Disney vault and took a shine to the Sword in the Stone. After evaluating White's Arthurian saga, Pete opted to take a few liberties with the story. Pete wanted the film to be playful and not beholden to every beat of White's narrative. Arthur's story was already immensely popular, and Pete wanted audiences to experience something imaginative and new. As part of a bold strategy, Pete storyboarded The Sword in the Stone all by himself. He wrote the entire screenplay before putting pen to paper, being careful about changing the story, abiding by Walt's wishes for the film to have substance and respect for the audience's intelligence. After altering the contents of White's novel to suit Disney's sensibilities, Pete took a hard look at his characters. While designing Merlin, Pete modeled the wizened wizard after Walt Disney himself. From Walt's intense nose to the Disney founder's tendency to fly off the handle, Merlin channels the original Imagineer with love and respect. Problems arose in making the sword and the stone when Pete had a difference of opinion with other members of the art department. Two key players in the dispute were animator Mark Davis and art director Ken Anderson. Neither artist, alongside a group of like-minded individuals, was interested in Pete's medieval masterstroke. They wanted to work on an updated version of the French play Chanticleer, featuring a story about a Gaelic rooster who thinks the sun rises with his unremarkable crowing. Pete and team Chanticleer were determined to continue working on their respective projects. Disney still needed help to keep its animation department open, even after the success of 101 Dalmatians. Instead of canceling either project outright, Walt had them compete for the lion's share of the studio's workforce. Opinions vary about what transpired to make Walt choose one project over the other. Ultimately, Walt chose the sword and the stone as the animation arm's primary focus. The decision left a sour taste in the mouths of those putting work into Chanticleer. But if they wanted to keep working at Disney, they'd have to suck it up and grant the boss's wish. Disney's The Sword and the Stone features Ricky Sorensen as the voice of the ward, Carl Swenson as the curmudgeonly wizard Merlin, Junius Matthews as Archimedes, the highly educated owl, Alan Napier as Wart's adoptive father, Sir Pellinor, Norman Alden as Sir Kay, and Martha Wentworth as the Mad Madam Mim. The Sword in the Stone implemented the same efficient animation process animators used to create 101 Dalmatians. Using the Xerox method, in which artists transfer photocopied drawings onto animation cells, the crew tasked with bringing Arthur's Odyssey to life worked around the clock to meet deadlines. Meanwhile, Disney's new touch-up method was rattling the nerves of the artists. Instead of cleaning up sketches, assistant animators drew directly on top of an animator's existing work. Many of Disney's seasoned animators feared this part of the process, thinking someone could ruin the foundation they laid at any given moment. Disney released The Sword and the Stone in London on December 12, 1963. The studio then unsheathed the film in theaters on December 18th in the United Kingdom and December 25th in the United States. All told, The Sword in the Stone collected $12 million worldwide. As for critics, many of them had mixed feelings about the Arthurian adventure. While some feel the movie could have presented a more meaningful narrative, others were dazzled by the movie's educational subject matter and charming cast of colorful characters. 
Although the sword in the stone is considered a Disney relic by today's CGI-driven standards, the film's appeal and characters live on thanks to other forms of Disney magic. You can find Merlin wandering the Disneyland Resort and Disney World Resort grounds and appearing in Walt Disney's Parade of Dreams at Disneyland Park. Disneyland also hosts a Sword in the Stone attraction involving guests trying to pull Arthur's Excalibur sword from an anvil in Fantasyland. Merlin often appears to host the ceremony-like event. I've tried to pull the sword from the anvil on several occasions. Alas, I remain a humble servant of Disney's kingdom to this very day. Merlin occupies the video game space as well. In addition to landing a supporting role in Square Enix's Kingdom Hearts video game franchise, the persnickety soothsayer appears as a world builder in the freemium mobile game Disney Magic Kingdoms. Finally, Merlin is a quest giver in the superbly polished simulation adventure game, Disney Dreamlight Valley. I highly recommend this last title to fans of games like Stardew Valley and Animal Crossing. It's pretty awesome. While some critics fail to see the magic of Disney's The Sword in the Stone, Reitherman's adaptation of White's timeless novel remains my favorite installment of the studio's animated classic catalog. In addition to introducing me to two of my all-time favorite Disney animated characters, Archimedes and Merlin, the artistry on display is incredible. The next time you watch Disney's The Sword in the Stone, pay extra attention to how the characters move. There's a beautiful fluidity to their elaborate gestures and interactions within the land of Camelot. Even during my most recent rewatch of the film, I marveled at Merlin's flowing robes, the striking movement of Arthur when he's transformed into a creature, and the eye-popping brilliance of Merlin and Madame Mim's wizard duel. Even the songs arranged by the Sherman brothers, Robert and Richard, are some of the best in Disney's early goings. Each tune drives the plot forward. The songs are playful and lyrically complex, making for an inspired medieval bop. I also adore the film's mission to remain informative while having fun in a fantasy realm frequented by witches, wizards, and a pike fish the size of a big Thunder Mountain railroad car. The Sword in the Stone never talks down to its audience, presenting you with valuable lessons to ponder regardless of age. If the film has one failing, I could see the formulaic nature of the plot falling short for some viewers. The story is on rails and rarely deviates from each stop along what I call Life Lesson Express. While I disagree, I can appreciate why others think the film doesn't deserve a perfect score. I'll give The Sword in the Stone a debatable 9 out of 10 Buzz Light years, on their behalf. However, in my heart, Reitherman's Arthurian adaptation is as perfect as it gets for an early edition in Disney's expansive animated library. It's been a pleasure taking this journey with you throughout the Animation Movies Revisited series. I hope you've had fun and learned plenty of exciting facts about your favorite animated films. Cheers, folks. Stay animated.